Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 69 of this series. The series is based on my book Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Base Disorders, a Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find my book on Amazon at the link below. We are still on Chapter 9, Metabolic Alkalosis. This is Part 3. Today we'll discuss the etiology of metabolic alkalosis. We said previously that metabolic alkalosis is an increase in blood pH to over 7.45 due to primary increase in serum bicarbonate. When that happens, you have respiratory compensation. And this respiratory compensation is an increase in PaCO2. We also said that metabolic alkalosis is the most common acid-base disorder in hospitalized patients, especially in a surgical critical care unit. Now, let's discuss the causes of metabolic alkalosis. We have two major categories. By far the most common is metabolic alkalosis with extracellular fluid volume contraction. Some people call that contraction alkalosis. Far less common is metabolic alkalosis with extracellular fluid volume expansion. How do we distinguish the two? Well, in the first case, the patient is dehydrated. The second case, it is not. But um, checking urine chloride is very helpful. It's not helpful to check urine sodium because urine sodium can be high even with contraction alkalosis because you have a lot of bicarbonate and the kidneys may be excreting the sodium with the bicarbonate. So we look at the urine chloride and a random or a spot urine chloride is less than 20 milliequivalent per liter or millimole per liter in case of contraction alkalosis or metabolic alkalosis with volume contraction and it is equal or above 20 with extracellular fluid volume expansion. Why do we call it contraction alkalosis? Because there is extracellular volume contraction or depletion associated with a fix. It is around a fixed amount of bicarbonate. Let's discuss the causes of metabolic alkalosis. To your right, you have extracellular volume contraction resulting in metabolic alkalosis. In yellow, you have the common causes. Vomiting and nasogastric suction are very common. High volume ileostomy output, we see that on a regular basis. Post-hypercapnic state alkalosis is very common, especially in an intensive care unit. And the use of diuretics, thiazide or loop diuretic, is very common, okay? This is very common and very commonly cause uh, metabolic alkalosis, especially if the patient is over diuresis, and urine chloride is variable in that case. Now, other causes in white, like chloride-rich diarrhea, villus adenoma, cystic fibrosis, barter, and Gittleman syndrome are not very common. If you are a busy nephrologist, you'll be lucky to see one case of all these uh, five things combined per year. Now, metabolic alkalosis with extracellular fluid volume expansion. Here we have primary aldosteronism, renal artery stenosis, or renin secreting tumors. Acute CHF patients on diuretics, this is a common cause. This is probably the only common cause in this category. Glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism, Cushing syndrome, exogenous mineralocorticoids, uh, fairly common. Um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia may be common in a, a pediatric setting, um, depending on uh, that setting, maybe at a university. Licorice use, uh, and it's very important to know that licorice reduced the activity of 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. And Little syndrome, very, very rare. I probably have seen one case in my entire career. Now, there are other important causes of metabolic alkalosis, and volume size is variable, so we cannot really neatly put it in category 1 or category 2, like any patient with hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, milk alkali syndrome, or calcium alkali syndrome, where patients have a reduced GFR that limit excretion of bicarbonate. Any patient with an alkali load, especially if the GFR is, re is reduced, or if you're giving a large amount of non-reabsorbable anion, like penicillin, carpenicillin, someone uh, with the uh, endocarditis, for example, and someone uh, who has refeeding status, refeeding post-fasting or starvation. You can have metabolic alkalosis. 
Why does vomiting cause metabolic alkalosis? It's uh, not like as simple as, okay, like you just lose uh, uh, by suctioning or by vomiting uh, the, the hydrogen. It's, it, so what, what really happens normally under normal circumstances, the gastric hydrogen potassium ATP secretes uh, HCL, okay, into the stomach lumen. Now, this HCL, once once it goes to the small bowel, it's neutralized by the bicarbonate secreted by the bowel. So, you have a, a net zero. So, the same amount of uh, HCL, uh, hydrochloric acid, secreted in the stomach lumen is uh, neutralized by a similar amount of bicarbonate. Now, if we're going to suction out or vomit out that uh, uh, HCl, then the bicarbonate, when it's dumped into the uh, lumen of the small bowel, is going to be absorbed into the blood, and this is why you're going to have uh, uh, metabolic alkalosis. Now, uh, the patient also, in that case, is uh, volume uh, contracted, and the kidneys eventually are going to uh, secrete that bicarbonate with sodium, resulting in volume depletion. Now, metabolic alkalosis, uh, after it is generated in patients with vomiting or NG, NG suctioning, it is maintained due to volume depletion. So you have decreased GFR that will activate the uh, aldosterone system. So you have secondary aldosteronism that will lead to loss of potassium. And uh, you have also increased distal de delivery of sodium bicarbonate that will increase uh, loss of potassium further. Now, we said that when you have hypokalemia, you have increase in ammonium that will uh, increase acid secretion. Um, you have a shift of hydrogen into the cells, and when that happens, uh, you are going to increase hydrogen excretion and uh, bicarbonate reabsorption. Now, in that case, of course, urine chloride is less than 20 because we have volume contraction. Urine sodium, again, is variable. It can be elevated because the kidneys are trying to excrete the bicarbonate with sodium. They're not doing an enough job. They're not doing an adequate job, but yet it's enough to cause elevated urine sodium. So you have, in cases of alkalosis, to check, check urine electrolytes or just check chloride. When does diarrhea cause metabolic alkalosis? Now, as a general rule, when you hear diarrhea, you should think non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Rarely in patients with villus adenoma or congenital chloridorrhea, you have metabolic alkalosis. And um, in the first case, in villus adenoma, you have loss of potassium in the stool and volume depletion and alkalosis. The second case, uh, you have a chloride-rich uh, diarrhea. This is a rare autosomal recessive disorder due to mutation in the SLC26A3 gene, resulting in loss of function of the ileal bicarbonate chloride exchanger. And uh, when that happens, you are going to have retention of bicarbonate and loss or secretion of chloride. So this is why you're going to have chloride-rich diarrhea. What about diuretics? Diuretics, especially when the patient is over diuretics, is a very common cause of metabolic alkalosis. Actually, when you start seeing that the uh, serum CO2 is rising, this is an indication maybe lower the dose of uh, diuretic because soon you're going to have uh, acute kidney injury, uh, severe hypokalemia, etc. So whether you have a thiazide diuretic or a loop diuretic, you can have metabolic alkalosis with extracellular volume contraction. You also have hypokalemia. You have, why? Because you have increased distal delivery of water and sodium and secondary hyperaldosteronism. All that will lead to hypokalemia. Now, urine chloride here is variable. If the patient is under the effect of diuretics, it's going to be high because there's loss of chloride. But when the diuretics wear off, it's going to be low. So if you're following a patient and uh, urine chloride sometimes is high, sometimes it's low, it may be an indication of diuretic abuse, especially if uh, you don't already know about uh, use of diuretics. What about other causes? Um, now, a Barter syndrome is not very common. It has uh, several subtypes due to mutations in the uh, sodium potassium 2, chlor 2 chloride exchanger in the ROMK channel in the Barton protein. And when you have Barter syndrome, you have the same manifestations like using a loop diuretic. So you are going to have metabolic alkalosis, blood pressure is going to be normal, you are going to have low uh, uh, potassium. 
uh, Gittleman syndrome. It's uh, due to loss of function mutation in the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal collecting duct. Same effects like a thiazide diuretic. So also you're going to have uh, hypokalemia, uh, especially you're going to have also hypomagnesemia. You're going, you are going to have normal blood pressure. You are going to have metabolic alkalosis. But in Gittleman syndrome, you have low urine calcium. So you have hypocalciuria. This is the opposite of what you have in Barter's. Uh, urine calcium should be normal or high in Barter's syndrome. So low urine calcium and maybe a severe salt craving uh, are characteristic of uh, Gittleman syndrome. Also, Barter's, you tend to see it more in children, Gittleman more in adults. You really need to do genetic testing. I mean, all of that is uh, speculative. Little syndrome is probably even rarer than Barter and Gittleman. This is a rare cause of severe hypertension. You suspect that if you have severe hypertension in a young person with strong family history, maybe uh, people getting strokes at a young age, and it's due to gain-of-function mutation of the epithelial sodium channel, the ENAC. So when that happens, you have increased absorption of uh, sodium, and when you have too much sodium, then the potassium is going to go out and uh, this is going to suppress the renin aldosterone. So you are going to have hyperrenemic hypoaldosteronism state with hypertension. Urine chloride is uh, elevated, um, I should mention, in Barter syndrome and in uh, Gittleman syndrome. What about post-hypercapnic state? In patients with acute respiratory acidosis, Bicarbonate goes up by one for each 10 millimeter of mercury increase in PA, PaCO2. In chronic respiratory acidosis, bicarb goes up by four for each 10 increase in PaCO2. So someone with chronic respiratory acidosis and a PaCO2 of 70 should have serum bicarbonate of 24 plus 12, four plus times three, okay, for each three tens because we have a 30 millimeter of mercury increase so this is three tens and for each 10 we are going to have a four increase so four times three is 12 plus 24 that gives us 36 so we should get a serum bicarbonate of 36 millimoles per liter or 36 milliequivalents per liter now in post hypercapnic state now okay we put a patient with copd on a ventilator and the paco2 came down but the bicarbonate is still high and it's going to take uh, some time before the kidneys uh, compensate and excrete all that bicarbonate. So we are going to have metabolic alkalosis in such post-hypercapnic states. What about cystic fibrosis? Excessive perspiration can cause metabolic alkalosis in cystic fibrosis. And this should be suspected, especially if you have metabolic alkalosis, volume depletion, and hyponatremia, especially in a heat wave. Aminoglycosides in patients with cystic fibrosis can cause barter-like syndrome because they activate the calcium sensing receptor, so PTH level will be low, you have increased urinary sodium, urinary potassium, urinary chloride, urinary magnesium, and this is exactly like taking a loop diuretic, and therefore you are going to have Bartle-like syndrome and metabolic alkalosis. So remember that activating the calcium sensing receptor results in inhibition of the sodium potassium 2-chloride transporter in the thick ascending limb, exactly like when you give a loop diuretic. Now, lastly, what about ECF volume expansion and metabolic alkalosis? An example is primary aldosteronism, which is due to unilateral aldosterone secreting adenoma or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Carcinoma is rare. With primary aldosteronism, of course, you are going to have hypertension, usually resistant, with hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and volume expansion. So urine chloride is going to be above 20 because of the expansion. Due to the effect of aldosterone, you are going to have enhanced distal sodium reabsorption, this increased volume status, while you are going to have enhanced potassium excretion and hypokalemia. Once you have hypokalemia, you are going to have enhanced generation of bicarbonate and retention, like we said, because hypokalemia is going to result in bicarbonate generation and loss of hydrogen. And... Uh, in that case, metabolic alkalosis is maintained due to autonomous aldosterone secretion. Unless you treat the tumor, you are never going to get rid of the alkalosis. I'm going to uh, end here. See you in the next lecture.